Hey, I'm Allison from Learning at the Primary Pond. I'm a literacy specialist, and in this video, I'm gonna talk about some specific ways that you can incorporate the science of reading effective practices into your phonics instruction. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, go ahead and do that now, and then also hit the little bell so that you're notified every time I post a brand new video about teaching literacy in K2. At the time that I'm recording this, there has been a ton of buzz and talk about the science of reading. And sometimes when people talk about the science of reading, they think that what we're really talking about is phonics instruction. But the reality is that phonics is just one small part of the body of research and science that makes up the science of reading as a whole. There's so much more involved, like vocabulary, comprehension. I actually ended up making a course to teach you about all aspects of the science of reading. So I'll include a link to that course in the caption in case you wanna dig in deeper. But for the purpose of the purposes of this video, since it's just going to be, you know, relatively short, we are going to focus in on some science of reading best practices and how they affect our phonics instruction specifically. I just want you to keep in mind that the science of reading encompasses so much more than just phonics. So that being said, I also have a question for you. Again, at the time that I'm recording this, the science of reading is being rolled out in a lot of schools or rather schools are making shifts and modifications to their instruction to implement the science of reading. So where are you at with science of reading? How are you feeling about it? Where is your school in terms of implementing it? I would love to hear because I feel like it really differs depending on where you are. So just let me know where you're at in the comments. Okay, let's get into our three ways to implement the science of reading into your phonics instruction. Way number one is to follow a scope and sequence. And you might be thinking, okay, Allison, I know I gotta follow a phonics scope and sequence, but there are some things to think about when you're doing this. So let's dig in a little bit more. Now, if you're not familiar with the scope and sequence was what a scope and sequence is, I do have a free one for you. It's in the caption of this video, so you can grab that. It's for K2 phonics skills. And a scope and sequence just tells you what skills are covered and it often tells you when to cover them. So my scope and sequence really just has a list of skills. Um, and then if you look at like the scope and sequence for my phonics program from sounds to spelling, we actually tell you when to cover them. But this is probably too small for you to see on the video, but like the page that I'm looking at has digraphs and then some CVC words and blends. So it's just the order of skills that you'll be covering. Now, Following a scope and sequence, meaning like a set sequence of skills, is something that's been backed by the science. Um, so it means that it's something that we should do right with our phonics instruction. But there's a couple of things to consider here. Number one, you want to make sure that whatever reading program you're using, or whatever phonics program, that the scope and sequence actually makes sense and follows like what developmental spelling and phonics research shows us. And so it should go something like this. And again, I'm just kind of talking about the K2 range. Obviously, what skills you cover are gonna depend on your grade level and then also your kids' abilities, right? But generally speaking, we wanna teach kids the alphabet, including the consonants and short vowel sounds. We wanna teach them to read CVC words, words with digraphs like SH, CH, TH. We want to move into blends. We want to get into long vowel patterns. Usually silent E is easier for kids to master. We also want to work on our controlled vowels, eventually diphthongs, multisyllabic words. So if you have some kind of program and you notice that the skills aren't sequential and don't really match up to what I was telling you, then definitely take a look at my free scope and sequence and see how you could adapt because while it's good to go back and review previously taught skills, we don't want those skills to be all over the place. Again, we want them to follow a set scope and sequence and increase in difficulty. So again, it's good to go back and review past skills, extremely important, and that's actually another best practice in the science of reading. However, we don't want like something to be introduced and then kids don't even really get to master it before they move on and the skills not to be in developmental order. So. Following a scope and sequence, super important, but also having the right scope and sequence is important as well. And again, you can look at a scope and sequence. This is based on developmental spelling research. You can grab that in the caption for this video. 
Our second way to apply the science of reading to our phonics instruction is to explicitly teach the relationships between phonemes and graphemes. So let me dive into both of these definitions, phonemes, graphemes. All right, so ignore this side right now. We're just gonna think about phonemes. Phonemes are the smallest sounds in words. They're speech sounds that we hear. So when you see phonemes represented by these slashes, that means that we're not talking about, we have to, when we write them down, we have to use letters, but we're not talking about spelling with phonemes. We're talking about sounds. So like the sounds n, sh, o, those are phonemes that you just heard me say. Okay. So we, when we write them down, we use the slashes to show that they're not actual like letters per se that we're talking about. We're just talking about the sounds. And then we have grapheme. So grapheme, a grapheme is just any letter or combination of letters that can be used to represent a phoneme. So sometimes graphemes are real simple, like the letter N representing the N sound, or maybe we have a pair of letters like this digraph SH representing the SH sound. This is a grapheme, one grapheme. You see two letters, but it's one grapheme because they're working together to represent one phoneme. Okay. And then what's tricky about English is that sometimes <laughs> for many sounds, there are multiple graphemes that can represent a phoneme. So with the sound O, there's a lot of different ways to spell it. Three of those ways are O, like in the word go, OA, like in the word boat, or OE, like in the word toe. There's more, but this is just, these are all, this is a grapheme, this is a grapheme, this is a grapheme, and all of these graphemes can represent the phoneme. Oh, tricky, right? So anyway, what we want to do when it comes to teaching phonics is we want to explicitly teach our kids, hey, this is the digraph SH and use the word digraph. I used to shy away from terms like that when I was first teaching. I was like, oh, that's too much for the kids. They don't need to know it. No, it's a powerful tool and it does help them talk about words and understand words better. So use the word digraph, use the word long vowel. Um, anyway, <laughs> side note there. So like you're teaching explicitly per the science of reading, the relationships between like the SH and teaching them, hey, the SH can work together to represent the sound sh. Okay, so you're modeling, you're explaining. What you're not doing is just waiting for kids to pick up these things on their own. You are teaching, you are reviewing, you are making sure that they can apply this stuff to their actual reading and spelling. And that's actually what we're gonna get into in just a moment. But the explicit instruction, you probably do this already, but it's just your lessons where you're saying, hey, you know, there are these, there are two different ways that to spell long O that we're gonna focus on today. There's a lot more, but we're just gonna focus on two. And then you teach those two, or you teach just one at a time, right? So it's that instruction where you're telling them the relationships again between phonemes and graphemes. So that's one easy way to implement the science of reading into your phonics instruction, and you may already be doing that. Our last strategy is to have kids practice decoding and encoding words with the target pattern that you're teaching. So for example, let's say that you're teaching kids that OR can represent the OR sound like in the word fork. We then wanna have our kids decode, meaning read, and encode, meaning spell, words, sentences, even entire texts using what they've just learned. Because just telling them, oh yeah, OR can represent the OR sound, and maybe giving them a couple of examples, that's great, that's like the start of your explicit instruction, but then the kids need to apply it. So let's focus first on some different ways that you can have kids decode words. Obviously, if you just have like words on the interactive board that you're like clicking through slides or word cards, or maybe you have kids, and this is from, from Sounds to Spelling, my phonics program, maybe you have kids reading a little word list, perhaps they're reading with a partner, perhaps before they read, they are using a highlighter or special marker to circle the or in these words. So like, for example, in born, they would be like highlighting or circling the OR so that when they actually read it, they are, you know, noticing, hey, this is the OR pattern that I just learned, okay? You'll also notice that there are some review words. This is kind of like a bonus fourth strategy for science of reading. Super important to go back and review patterns that have been previously taught. Kids need, Wiley Blevin says, four to six weeks of intentional review after a skill has been covered so that they really master it. So 
there's a little bonus for you. But anyway, back to decoding. A list of words is great for this, but really anything, you know, they, you might have sentences with a lot of OR words. You might have a decodable text that has a lot of OR words. You don't have to do this all in one sitting, right? Like maybe day one is they're decoding just a word list and maybe a couple of sentences. And then maybe day two, they're decoding more challenging words and they're reading the decodable text. So you can kind of split it up across multiple lessons. But I like to include both decoding and encoding in every lesson. So let's move on to encoding. So encoding is just taking the information that the kids now know about, for example, how the OR can represent the OR sound in some words and using that to spell sounds. So it literally could be you just tell them, okay, spell the sound OR and they write in a whiteboard OR. I know it's a word, but it's also a sound, right? So or the word, but like if we were working on AR and you said R, the kids would spell AR on their whiteboard. So it could be putting sounds, individual sounds down. It could be making words. They could use something like magnetic letters and maybe you have them go through and make like some different OR words. Um, and you're also getting them to segment too, right? So if you want them to spell the word born, b born born. So they're getting in that phonological awareness, that phonemic awareness practice too. I have other videos on phonemic awareness if you're interested in that. But anyway, I feel like I'm going down a bunch of rabbit holes here, but <laughs> encoding, spelling words, right? You can have them spell them on whiteboards. You can have them write whole sentences where like, for example, maybe you choose um, a couple of OR words and you put them together in one sentence. Like I was born to play sports, OR in born, OR in sports. And then you, when you're dictating a sentence, you only use either high frequency words that the kids have been taught or words with the with phonics patterns that they've already been taught. So you wouldn't include a word that has maybe like a diphthong in it if you haven't taught diphthongs. So you're really thinking about what words you're having them spell and what words go into those sentences that you're having them practice with. Um, so writing words, sentences, all of that is encoding and you can do it with multi-sensory material. You can do it with magnetic letters, with whiteboards, but Regardless, you want them to be putting down the sounds and representing them with actual letters. And encoding practice actually helps them get better at decoding too, okay? So that was our third strategy. Make sure that kids are practicing decoding and encoding with the specific pattern that you just taught them. All right, so I hope this was helpful. If you wanna go more in depth on how to teach phonics, I have so much more to share with you and I'm gonna include a link to a free webinar that I have. It's just a one hour training all about teaching phonics in K2. You can see more materials that I use and get more ideas. So make sure to check that out in the caption. I also put my science of reading full course in the caption as well and the free scope and sequence. So there's lots of goodies for you there. Um, so I think that's it. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this was helpful. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and I will see you in my next video.